Hello and welcome to Unramblings, a podcast about stories and storytelling. I'm Mark, I have a background in English literature and storytelling. And I'm Charlene and I have a background in social work and psychology. And at some point we'll be doing this long enough that we won't have to give context of our backgrounds for doing this. Or we'll just have it pre-recorded. Yeah, we'll just introduce ourselves and move along. Yep. So before we get into this, I wanted to take a moment to note our sound quality for today. I'm hoping that this is an improvement, or it won't be, in which case I'm sorry. Our good friend Andrew Powell has loaned us some better quality microphones, which we've managed to get one of them functioning for us. So we're recording on like a real actual microphone today instead of the built-in microphones on our computer, which if you didn't know that's how we recorded, that's why our sound quality has never been good. Yeah. Also, Andrew Powell of the Muppets Conversation fame. Yes. Yes, the very same. Because he listened to that episode and said, Ah, I'd like to weigh in on these points, and also your sound quality sucks. And we were like, we know. Yes. We do hope that at some point we can get ourselves a couple of decent quality microphones and a mixer so that we can have, like, our own microphone each and things, but that will be at some point in a distant future when we have money. I'm excited for it. It's going to be great. That far away time when we have money? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway... Okay, so this week we are discussing The Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler. If you're tuning in expecting Veronica Mars, you missed our Facebook post where we said that we lied in the David Bowie episode. We got it wrong the first time. We switched the order because it makes more sense this way. Trust us. Yes, we'll explain why later. Okay, obviously there are going to be spoilers throughout this for the entirety of The Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler. And it is a mystery, so if you haven't read it and you plan on reading it and, and you know, you like mysteries... Yeah, you might not want to listen to this because it's going to spoil the whole thing. And yeah, that's Unless kind of the point of a mystery novel is to not know what's going to happen. I, I do know people who read mystery novels by le- reading the last few pages first. They're wrong and I judge them, but they do exist. So maybe people don't care. Okay. We'll drop in any future spoiler warnings and content warnings right here. Hello, no real spoilers to add on to this week. As far as content warnings, we talk about the violence that happens in the book, as well as the sexual harassment and stalking that happens in the book. We don't really get particularly graphic in those discussions. And we also discuss the homophobia and stereotypes included in the book as far as depiction of people of different races, prejudices in in general that are visible in the story. I think that's it. Okay, we'll send you back to the past. Welcome back! Okay, who's going to do the summary of work this week? Do you want me to try and summarize it? You go for it. So in The Big Sleep, Philip Marlowe, who is a private detective, is hired by an ex-military general to resolve an issue where one of he's being blackmailed with his daughter's gambling debts, I believe, and it turns out she's also being blackmailed for nude photos. So Philip Marlowe investigates this. There's also... Some between-the-lines concern on the general's part that his other daughter's husband, who had who has left his daughter, might be involved, which would upset the general because he really liked that guy. So Marlo is also sort of poking around about that guy. And essentially, he kind of sniffs around and gets involved with a bunch of different underground criminal enterprises, gets beaten up and threatened and sexually harassed, and eventually resolves the both the blackmail and the case of the missing son-in-law by the end of the book. Did you say that's a decent summary? Yeah, a little meandering in places, but I think. Well, the book itself is pretty meandering. Yeah, it's it's not got a straight plot there. Um, I believe that the original title was the case of the missing son-in-law. Um, yeah, so. I don't know, it's kind of an oddly constructed story because it seems to just be about the blackmail at first, but then that whole plot point gets wrapped up about midway, and then there's sort of what seems to be a tangent ends up diverting into figuring out what happened to the son-in-law, and that's pretty much the second half of the book. So it it doesn't really have a concise plot. And we'll get into that a little bit more Yeah. later. But does that sound about right? Yeah. Okay. And to prepare for this, we both read the book. I had never read it before, um, so it was a first for me. I've never really read any mystery novels that weren't contemporary urban fantasy, like Dresden Files, which are heavily influenced by this work and this genre. 
except for the Nancy Drew mysteries that I read when I was a kid, which are also classic hot bull detective. Heavily influenced, I'm sure, by this genre. So it was interesting to read this because I know it's something that has been an influence on Mark a lot. It was interesting to yes. read it after reading Mark's novel because then I could recognize a lot of the references to The Big Sleep in Kingdom Come, which is yes. Mark's novel, which is out of print. Sorry, guys. Yeah. I read the book quite a few years ago, along with some other of the original Hardball Detective stuff, and it ended up becoming a sort of central basis for my own novel, Kingdom Come, which is a sort of sci-fi take on the whole genre. It's set in a futuristic world where realms have been recreated around ideas and times in history. Um, and a lot of it takes place in 1930s LA with a sort of character that's loosely based on Philip Marlowe and the events that take place are sort of poking fun at some of the ideas that take place in that. And also I'm looking for representation, so if there's an agent out there would like help me get that republished, that would be great. And ramblingspodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, but there we go. We did the brief summary of work, description of preparation. Okay, so we'll get into it. Yep. I guess we can have a quick chat about sort of where this sits in the zeitgeist. Sure. Is that the right use of the word zeitgeist? Okay, so this this novel, along with like some work by Dashiell Hammett, things like the Maltese Falcon, Red Harvest, all the Continental Operative books, uh, really sort of start off the hard-boiled detective genre, where like if you think of 1930s private detective, you've got that sort of narration about the rain being hard and all this sort of things. And, like, he's walking around with his hat and his, you know, trench coat and everything. That, like, smoking a cigarette in an alley. Like, all those images you have of a private detective in America. This is where that comes from. And, like, it's sort of spent the last hundred years influencing everything that you've ingested about private detectives. I'm trying to think of some good examples. There's been plenty of pastiches. Sarah Paretsky wrote a series of novel is writing a series of novels about V.I. Wachowski, who's sort of a female private detective that gets a lot of like callbacks to Philip Marlowe in a lot of the criticism of it. And I mean criticism as in literary criticism, not as in like people telling saying it's trash. It's not trash, you should go and read those books, they're great. And then even into other things where you wouldn't necessarily expect to see it. For example, next week we're doing Veronica Mars, which made a lot more sense to do after the episode on The Big Sleep because it draws on that same sort of idea of a private detective. There's jokes that Keith Mars and Veronica make in that show that are based off of these books in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like to add? I think that, to me, it seems like this is sort of a progression and modernization of... The, the romanticized idea of, like, the cowboy or, like, the lone gunslinger, you yeah. know, somebody who kind of takes the law into their own hands and just does what needs to get done and is sometimes on the right, right side of the law and sometimes on the wrong side and has this sort of weird and ever-changing relationship with, you know, the the legal channels and, like, the proper authorities, I guess. Yeah, and I think that that's something that we'll get into more later on, but it's certainly, you can, having literally written a thesis on the history of this, like, you can go directly from westerns into the private detective genre and all the way up to present day. It's a very straight line. I didn't it, see it here. I thought I was clever for seeing that. You just ruined it. Well, you are, because you went into it without any of the other stuff. I went and read books that told me that, so. Ah, okay. Um, so, so it, I am also smart. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, Just glad we verified that on on the record. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to derail your thought there. Um, but I mean, I think it's it's that sort of American, not necessarily healthy ideal of the lone guy going it by, by themselves mm -hmm. sort of thing. But as I think we'll look back around to that with some of the more precise things that we're talking about in this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of the stuff that we're going to talk about later with mystery as a genre and such. Yeah. In this book in particular, I felt like there was an interesting mix of very progressive ideas that are still very relevant today, like criticism of the criminal justice system and classism and class divides and income inequality, along with some of the prejudices that are still very prevalent there and are certainly a part of Philip Marlowe's worldview and subtler biases that he has that he may not even almost certainly does not even see as a problem or 
biased, you know? Yeah. So, like, there's definitely some racist characterizations, some homophobia, and some misogyny in his perspective. But then there's also that, you know, some very progressive ideas in there. Yeah. Um, I, it reminds me, I did mean to do a little sort of heads up at the front of this, similar to with when we did the Dr. Seuss stuff, of, like, there is some stuff in this book that is very much not okay with how certain cultures are portrayed, etc. We're taking it of the time. We are going to discuss it a little bit. We're not saying that any of that is okay. Yeah, definitely no longer acceptable. A lot of the things, a lot of the words used, a lot of the characterizations. I, I go into this with very much the same way that I go into like Shakespeare's Othello with like, yeah. This can tell us a lot about the time and why there were some fucked up things going on. Yeah. Um, we can appreciate it as an art and understand that there's a problem there, but also mm -hmm. appreciate it as a historical document of how people were talking and viewing the world at the time. Yeah. So I think it probably, from you saying that, makes sense. Let's uh, start off talking about some of the stuff with the police and corruption and such. We sure. We talked about how already we've got Marlow as this character who's sort of outside the law and has that odd relationship with it. So I think talking about police and corruption and how he doesn't necessarily work within those structures makes sense. Yeah. So on page 62, there's a quote, he didn't know the right people. That's all a police record means in this rotten crime ridden country. Under my heading police corruption, the first thing that is, is page 62 and that quote. <laughs> yeah. So, and I, I feel like that could just as easily be said about now, you know, it's, yeah. You saw that when you were a victim advocate in New York for a bit, in Albany, New York. Yeah. Where you saw, you know, strings of young kids brought in on, like, marijuana possession, and pretty much the black kids got actual sentencing, and the white kids got off with a warning, and that's... It's the not knowing the right people. It's the re yeah. it's the bias in the system. And, and with those kids, like with the, I think that they were all students at the university, mm -hmm. and all had the same student representative lawyer type situation going on, and the same judge handed out different penalties. Yeah, um, and that's not even knowing the right people, but it's being seen in a certain way by the right people, in this case, by the judge. Yeah. Um, and that's just racism and, bi and just the bias of our system. There's also a bit about plea deals a little later in the book. And it's about the, the guy who's been arrested for the first murder, I think. Or no, the second murder. Uh, Carol Lundgren. Yeah, that's Geiger's mm -hmm. boyfriend. Carol Ondren, the boy killer with the limited vocabulary, was out of circulation for a long, long time, even if they didn't strap him in a chair over a bucket of acid. They wouldn't because he would take a plea and save the country money. They all do that when they don't have the price of a big lawyer. Exactly. So it's like you're seeing this thing of, yeah, this guy did kill somebody in revenge for the murder of his significant other, and he's broke so he's going to take a plea deal and it's just this criticism of the system where the the judgment and the punishment the consequences are different whether you know depending on how much money you have and whether or not you're able to get a decent lawyer to represent you which i think really comes through in the end of the book in a really direct way which, you know if you like reading the last three pages of the book this is here where you've got carmen sternwood who there's some issues there but the takeaway is like take her away and get her help Mm -hmm. and I won't bring this up and ruin your family's reputation. And this sort of family with lots of money is able to just sort of hide away their murderous child rather than there be any actual retribution towards anything there. Yeah. Which it... means that the person she killed is going to keep rotting in an oil sump. Yeah. Because to backtrack a little for people who... Because, again, the plot summary is a little convoluted. So if we want to unravel this a little bit... Marlow is hired by General Sternwood. His two daughters are... Vivian and Carmen. Vivian and Carmen. Vivian is the older one, and Carmen is the younger one who's being blackmailed with nude photos and gambling debts. She also, it turns out, has epilepsy. Becomes important later on, but she is getting nude photographs taken of herself by Geiger, who's the guy who runs the, the porn ring who is gay and with Carol Lundgren. The driver, the chauffeur of the family of the Sternwoods liked Carmen, 
and found out about this and killed Geiger. Carol then killed Joe Brody, who he thought had killed Geiger. This is not who killed Geiger. So he killed the wrong guy in Retribution. And he's the one that Marlo is talking about is probably going to take a plea deal because he's broken and won't be able to get a fancy lawyer. And then in contrast, Carmen killed her older sister's husband because he wouldn't sleep with her in a possible epileptic fit. Yeah. It's very weird and very problematic in terms of depiction of mental illness as um, being a factor that leads someone to be a perpetrator of violence rather than a victim of violence. Which is particularly upsetting considering that you do see Carmen taken advantage of a lot as well in terms of, like, she's drugged and has nude photographs taken of her that are then used to blackmail her. That's not okay either. But, so you do have this interesting contrast where you have this person who killed her sister's husband and then also tries to kill Marlo for the same reason, for rejecting her, for not sleeping with her when she breaks into his house and crawls into his bed and he's like, get the hell out of my house, which is fair. And she gets a very different consequence at the end when Marlo's like, yeah, just get her the hell away from being able to hurt people. Yeah. That was very long. Sorry. It's a complicated story. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, we touched on you touched on a lot of things in there that I want to talk about. But at the same time, I don't want to get too far away from our conversation about the police. Yeah. Um, I think we should loop back on the mental health stuff, particularly. And Definitely. Also, yeah. And also on some sexual stuff that goes on there. Yeah. And Carmen as a character. Yeah. But... She certainly doesn't receive much in the way of consequences because of who her family is. That we see in the book, at least. Yeah. So part of something that I think is interesting for the time and sort of tied to the corruption is this sort of note on expansion and the size of the city hmm. and that within the scope of the country. You get sort of several comments about things like, um, like there's a lot of tough people have checked in here lately. It's the penalty for growth. And, like, as the city is getting bigger and bigger, it's attracting more people that are, quote, tough. And I think that's pretty clearly a reference to organized crime. Like, as right. you have the expansion of Los Angeles, you also have the interest of organized crime that had already established a pretty strong presence in, like, Las Vegas, which isn't that far. It's a few hours drive from yeah. Vegas to LA. But I mean, within that, you also get things like um, when Carmen's gun goes off in Brody's apartment and breaks a pane of glass, there's the comment that noises like that don't mean much anymore. Like, no mm -hmm. one cares that a gun's gone off and broken a pane of glass. Like, people are just like, okay. Well, I think that's also partly a commentary on where Brody lives. Like, it's not a great neighborhood. It's not, I mean, he himself is a shady character and. It seems like he lives in a neighborhood that gunshots aren't super uncommon in. Yeah. There's sort of notes about city cops and their cover-ups of certain things. Um, mm -hmm. When you have the sort of wrap-up of the first half of the book. Yeah. Um, and they're sort of like trying not to let it know, be known about Geiger's ring because it's operating on Main Street. And there's this note that like, yeah, the cops know what's going on. They just don't. Really close care. it. They don't <laughs> close it down because it's better to like it's the re reference to like the red light districts and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's better to know where that's going on so that when there's an issue, you know where to go than have it be entirely see like it's going to happen sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you get the sort of combination of like with Ols talking to Kronjega, who are both police. Yeah, yeah. And Kronjega's like the big like the big guy in the city, like the chief of police. Or something, or the head of missing persons. He, or he's a no. That's um. That's Captain Gregory. He's oh, okay. um. He's a captain of homicide, I think. Okay. Um, and there's sort of this antagonism about like city cops not knowing where to put their feet, not to break their ankles, and things like this, and sort of just mm -hmm. this this sense that the city is growing, and that there's this discomfort with some people who have been around a little bit longer about what that's meaning for everything. And, like you have a com comment from the DA. Yeah, in reference to Geiger's place being open, allowed to operate where it does, and talking about it coming up, Marlo says, I dare say the grand jury would like to know what those reasons are. Wild grinned, he said. Grand juries do ask those embarrassing questions sometimes, in a rather vain effort to find out why, just why cities are run as they are. And then that expands into, at the end of the book, there's a comment. Yeah, when Captain Gregory is talking about what he'd like to see and what he'd expect to be, he says that he's reasonably honest, as honest as you could expect a man to be in a world where it's out of style. 
um, and then says that like he he knows that the things he liked to happen won't happen, and says it's uh, not in this town, not in any town half the size in any part of this wide, green, and beautiful USA. We just don't run our country that way, which I think goes to just what we were talking about with like corruption and inequality. And it it's still like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I suspect it's because the people in power aren't the people who want that to change. Yeah. The people in power are the Sternwood family rather than the Marlowe's, I guess. Yeah. I had the same note in terms of this topic, the same passage about uneven justice, essentially, and saying, like, you know, there's this ideal of justice where, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from or how much money you have. All that matters is what you've done and who you are, you know, your own merits or demerits, I guess. But that's not that that's not how things actually are handled by the criminal justice system, by juries at, at any stage of the process, really. Yeah, I think I could go on about some of this stuff for a very, very long time. Sure. Um, I think it is worth noting that there's even a note in this Marlowe's criticizing the police and commenting on like the fact that they'll oh in defense for him not having given out information that might have saved somebody else. Um, he criticizes the police in kind for their, like, shooting of petty thieves. Yeah. Like, shooting someone as they run down an alley with a woman's purse or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, like, just that sort of, like, I mean, you, you care about saving people's lives that much mm-hmm. when you're using that level of force. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely also um, wanted to make sure we mentioned that this book at several different points criticizes police brutality and use of excessive force for, like, petty crime that, you know, would never get you the death penalty or even life in prison, but seems to be hand-waved away or excused if it's in the process of pursuing a criminal um, and just how much of a problem that is. And, of course, that's not something that's really changed in the intervening 90 years or whatever. When was this book written? Uh, 39. 39, yeah. yeah so in the yeah. intervening, like, 80 years. If we'd done this episode a week ago, we could have said it was the 80-year anniversary. Mm-hmm. So. I think that the way the death penalty is handled in the book is really interesting, because Marlowe criticises its use, use in certain ways, mm-hmm. but at the same time is inclined to use it as a scare tactic. Like, yeah. You get the impression he doesn't agree with it, and, like, that's sort the of thing, but at the same time, when he's, like talking to Carol Lundgren after a fight or something, mm-hmm. he, like, goes through the details of what being in a gas chamber is like. Yeah. And that's driving for breath in a really unpleasant scene. It is, and I, I think that's part of him, like, using something that horrifies him. Like, he knows it's horrifying, he feels how horrifying that is, and so he's using it in an instrumental way to scare somebody else in the interest of his own life. Because that's the whole point of that, is he's that's for his own advantage to scare Carol Lundgren and intimidate him. Yeah. And I think that's part of how you can tell that that's something that bothers and upsets him. He's dwelled on this idea before, and that's why he can paint such a vivid and terrifying picture of it. Yeah. But then that sort of image of the death penalty gets an interesting parallel to it with his killing of Canino at the end, um, where he shoots him several times in the stomach. Mm-hmm. And it's... Marlowe doesn't seem entirely comfortable with it, necessarily. Mm-hmm. He does dwell on it a bit. But you get much more of a... The idea that he's upset that he's being yelled at about it. That's what is dwelled on, is that he spent all night had, standing on different bits of carpet while people yelled at him. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, I feel that it's presented as much more justified because Canino is presented as a very two-dimensional character where who's very villainous he's comically villainous Mm -hmm. like his introduction is murdering someone who's shown as being sort of naive and foolish um and Mm good-hearted and then after that he sort of chats the marlo a bit and then attacks him yeah it's interesting that he shoots canino in the stomach because earlier in the book i forget if it's someone threatening marlo or marlo threatening somebody it's marlo threatening lundgren marlo threatening lundgren about shooting in the belly specifically and like how long that takes to die and how much how much you suffer over the course of that and that was another one of those things that felt like very like a western to me yeah it's like the gut shot is such a thing in westerns and in that kind of 
cowboy aesthetic, I guess, or not aesthetic, but you know what I mean. Um, and so I think that that's another one of those, like, boogeymen that Marlo, that keeps Marlo up at night, that he's then using to preserve his own life. Yeah, well, not only that, but he, like, he says, like, that ties into the death penalty thing, because he says, like, like, you'll survive it. You'll mm-hmm. be in, you'll take you three months to get over it, but you'll survive enough to then walk to the gas chamber. Mm-hmm. Um, which is grotesque in its own way. Yeah. Okay, what else have we got to say about cops? I mean, I don't really have much else to say about that. I mean, I feel like that just comes under the heading of things in this book that where it's the more things change, the more things stay the same. And that's, I think, the biggest one for me as far as that. Yeah. You know, just, uh, it's, like, tiresomely familiar. Yeah, I mean, there's some more stuff with the rackets about, like, how during Prohibition there were cops in Eddie Mars's place making sure that you didn't bring in your own illegal alcohol you had to buy the illegal alcohol that was being sold there yeah Um, yeah definitely i mean that's just the corruption which we do already kind of talk about a little bit and the head of missing persons is friend quote friends with eddie mars like there's definitely a line of communication there yeah there is some interesting stuff with that guy about how he sort of likes to present himself into this idea of being like kind of useless and tired and being a hack Mm-hmm. But then it becomes apparent later on that that is an act. Yeah. And that he does know what he's doing, but what he's doing isn't always necessarily what the people coming to him for help are interested in and is perhaps more interested more about how he is keeping the city afloat. Right. Got a note here about finding a person that can take the fall for a crime rather than necessarily the person did it with um, talking about Brody. Yeah. Um, like Marlo sort of paints a picture of how Brody could be set up for it. Um, and Brody's like, well, that's not true. It's like, well, yeah, you can still step off for it. You're made to order for it. Yeah. Um, I think that goes back to what you were saying before about the corruption within the police department and, like, that they're not necessarily in the pursuit of justice so much as the appearance of justice, as especially as the city expands and there's more organized crime and it's just all harder to handle. Does that make sense? Yeah. In the discussion uh, with Vivian about the whole situation um she implies that he's the one that killed geiger and brody mm-hmm. um and he says oh you think i accounted for geiger or brody or both of them she didn't say anything i didn't have to i said i might have i suppose and got away with it neither of them would have hesitated to throw lead at me and she responds that just makes you a killer at heart like all cops which is um, a bleak view, and uh, thank God we don't live in that world anymore. Uh, anyway, was there anything you wanted to say about the sort of moral, ethical, legal side of this stuff? Yeah, definitely. Like, you see a lot of different decisions being made according to different types of rules. So, yeah, I definitely had a note about moral versus legal versus ethical, and I... Do you want to start by sketching out the distinctions there? What, you know, what I'm talking about when I say that these are all different ways that we see decisions in this particular book. So just like cursory looking online in terms of different definitions of this does kind of line up with my thoughts on it. Essentially, morality is sort of based on your own principle regarding right, right and wrong, like as an individual you know, what you've internalized as your values. Then your ethics are based on rules that are external to you, but often associated with a specific framework like your the ethics of your job or the ethics of your role in an interaction, of you know, who you are in a particular enclosed system. And then the legal framework is the society as a whole, the laws that govern society as a whole, what is legal or illegal literally if that makes sense i mean i feel like that one's pretty cut and dried yeah so you see marlo make a lot of illegal decisions or at least questionably legal decisions like not reporting geiger's murder and things like that based on the ethics of his profession as a private investigator you know where it would complicate his ability to pursue the case that he's on if he were to do that so he doesn't 
men, he makes different moral decisions, like whether or not to shoot somebody, which would, again, potentially be questionable legal or even ethical decisions, but ones that he makes based on his own conscience. And there's the point when Carmen tries to seduce him. Yeah. And another point when Vivian tries to seduce him. And in both of those situations, he has this ethical objection. And quite, and also, I think, I think he might use the ethical justification to also cover his just disinterest and distaste for being seduced by these women who he has no respect for. But he at least excuses it as you're the daughter of my client like that's inappropriate essentially like there's a there's a boundary within my profession where i should not cross that line well i think with the common side of things like he's already given a couple of other excuses and then he's like okay if for no other reason Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna do this because i'm working for your dad damn it Mm -hmm. and no yeah yeah that makes sense but, I mean, those aren't the only examples, but it happens yeah. over and over where, but his justification is not the same for every call he makes. But, you know, he goes to, legal is never the line, is one of the interesting things to me. His own personal moral code and his ethical code of the profession are always what he goes to, to justify a decision. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. And, like, he, um, like, he does let murders go unreported, mm-hmm. but then solves murders incidentally and brings people in who he feels need to be brought in. Mm-hmm. Um, Presumably based on his own moral ideas of what's right and wrong. Yeah. And I think it's, I think that's sort of interesting with, um, if you, if Bernie Oles, the one of the cops actually makes an interesting comment about it being glad that Owen, who killed Geiger, is already dead mm-hmm. because he would feel bad, like having to send someone to the chair for killing someone who was taking nude photos and things and like blackmailing, like someone who he views as not being a good part of society. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, you know, I'm glad that I don't have to go through the legal ramifications. Like legally, I would have to arrest this guy, mm-hmm. but I kind of agree with what he did, side mm-hmm. of things. And Marlowe's in a position where he doesn't have to worry about that because he doesn't have the... I mean, he does have to worry about it, but he's got that freedom to go, not my monkey. Yeah. But then at the same time, his investigation of what happened to Rusty Reagan, Vivian's husband, Mm -hmm. is driven entirely by... Like, he's not concerned that something illegal might have happened. He's got this sort of... The moral and ethical obligations of... He thinks that the general does want to know what happened mm-hmm. and feels that he needs to fulfill that as part of that. But also, I think, part of his own personal curiosity of wanting to know why people keep trying to be like, oh, you must be looking for this guy. He's like, no. But everyone's saying that makes me think I should. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted to just point it out because it's also something that you see carried throughout the genre and like the other things that are influenced by it. And also that I think was carried into it from like Westerns, you know, cause it's this whole idea yeah. of like operating outside of the law by your own moral and ethical codes by the, by the ethical codes of the job and the agreement you've made, but also by your own internalized ideas of what's right and wrong in a particular situation, the law, you know, being inconsequential to that decision. And I think that that's or a... incidental maybe. Yeah, I think it's um, a line that can be drawn, for better or for worse, from that sort of Western idea through these sorts of things, through to the libertarian and, like, the don't tread on me kind of Mm -hmm. mindset of, like, the government shouldn't be the one making these decisions, it should be my code. Mm -hmm. I don't think that necessarily everybody has the code that we should necessarily have that point of view, but that they're... Do you see where I'm going with that? Yeah, and it's a it's a stance that I completely understand in people who do have a clear idea of right and wrong and have a certain kind of optimism that everyone does. And people who, I guess, in, in some degree must think that people are inherently good, which is an interesting philosophical orientation to ascribe to a diehard libertarian but I don't see how you could trust society built entirely on people's sense of right and wrong unless you do believe that everyone does have some common ideas of what's right and wrong. 
And unfortunately, I think a lot of that breaks down when you put in factors like tribalism and certain stresses of resource and things like that and biases. Then, unfortunately, a lot of our values, we don't extend the same ideas of right and wrong to everybody. Yeah. So, or to our treatment of everyone. Well, I mean, I think the problem is that there's people who will say the government shouldn't get involved. I should be allowed to do this, that and the other. I should be allowed to own whatever weapons I want, protect my land in however I want, all these sorts of things that I get sort of edgy about. But then there's the other end of the spectrum where we end up in a situation where we should just saying, we have people saying, I should be able to feed the homeless. Mm -hmm. And we have government organizations and police stepping in and saying, no, you can't and arresting people for that. Yeah. One of those I agree with more than the other. And we'll see what hate mail we get for me saying that. <laughs> yeah. It's difficult because there's no perfect solution because there's so many situations. You, the problem is, is that to, as you say, like you can't rely on everyone having what we would describe as good judgment on these things and looking out for everybody. Yeah. Rather, it's the difference between looking out for everybody and saying, I got mine. Yeah. But we're, we're getting into some heady political things which aren't necessarily tied to this book at that point. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to add on that stuff before we move on? In terms of things that I still see as very major themes in art now, the influence of media and movies on people's behavior and people's ideas of archetype, I think that was also interesting because it, it right. reminds me of our conversation from uh, Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust on the rise of the influence of celebrities. Yeah. Where it's like, I feel like this is calling this out because it's only just started. This has started to be a thing where you're seeing petty thugs putting on these attitudes and saying these things that they've seen petty thugs say in movies, etc. The, the elaborate tough guy of the pictures. Yes. The pictures have made them all like that. Yeah, exactly. And it's just, it was interesting to see that at this time because that can't have been a thing for that long. It's at a point when they're still saying the pictures. Exactly. Exactly. And so I thought that was really interesting because we still see a lot of people, you know, raising similar concerns or observing similar trends where it's like, you know, people who are being named after characters of popular movies and television shows, like those becoming the most popular baby names and like all of these pop culture phenomena that are directly attributable to particular you know, works of art in yeah. the public consciousness. Well, it gets really interesting because, I mean, there's another one where it's Canino is examining each of his fingernails individually and it's as Hollywood has taught it should be done. Yeah. Um, And it's entertaining that this book then gets, I think, in 1946? Maybe 48. I don't know. doesn't matter. Gets made into a movie. Mm -hmm. And it, like, it's that sort of film noir stuff mm -hmm. that is... I don't know what history you know of film noir and what in history anyone has any interest in of it at this point. But like that movement and the sort of creation of film noir in America was partially influenced by World War II and sort of French films not necessarily being accessible. And it's sort of an imitation game and that's why it's film noir instead of other things. And this sort of being part of the birth of that movement in the States. Yeah, it's interestingly r recursive. Yeah, I mean like... If I go to a Halloween party as a private detective, I'm going to wear the hat and the coat and I'm, I don't know, a fake cigarette or something, and I'm going to stand under a street lamp, as Hollywood has taught me it should be done. <laughs> um, yeah. That's interesting. There's not a lot to say about it, I just no. wanted to point it out. Okay. So I think throughout there's a lot of issues in the way people are portrayed, particularly women, the Jewish community... Chinese people or sort of ch not even Chinese people but Chinese culture mm -hmm. I'm not sure that there's actually any Asian individuals in the book Carol Lundgren is described as being Asian is he? I, th I thought so okay that would make a certain amount of sense in and a I, problematic way and I also had some interesting observations about that because he's also c constantly characterized as being very young yeah and like constantly called like boy and stuff and it's questions yeah. about whether he's actually very young or whether this is an assault on Asian masculinity or like yeah so but... the sort of issue I have with if we talk about sort of the the Jewish Chinese and homosexual community image that's put into the book 
like there's a lot of statements made which are painting everyone with the same brush yeah and problematic it's interesting that it doesn't ever seem to go much further than that does that make any sense um elaborate there's descriptions provided that aren't flattering but there's not and like that you could draw negative connotations from Mm -hmm. but it Within the story, there's no then sort of development of that that I can see necessarily mm. into there being a more direct these people are bad or these people. Sure, are bad. there are some superficial generalizations, but it, sounds, it doesn't ever really go beyond that. It sounds like someone repeating stuff they've heard about people. Mm. Like it, it strikes me as stereotypes of the time. Mm hmm. And not someone who's got it out for people in particular. Mm -hmm. So, like, I've got some notes from a few pages that are quite close together where I was sort of trying to work out what is going on with some of the homophobia in here. And it, uh, like, first I'm thinking, like, it's all stated in fact, as fact. Like, Mm -hmm. it's people like you, and he uses terms like fag. Mm-hmm. And there's sort of some generalizations there. Like, about weakness and stuff, because there was one thing about, like, like, essentially, like, that gay men can't punch or something. Yeah. It was real, like, it's it, like, okay. It was... that, that was when I was like, oh, that's not stated. That's, that starts to be more of a, like, aspersion. Yeah. Where it's, the, the line is, um, like, he gets punched by the, by Carol Ungren and is like, but it doesn't matter because pansies have no iron in their bones. Yeah. Um, I'm just like, oh, oh no, that's, that that's a problem. Yeah. And there's sort of a judgment on him as, like, that that is negative. That is not mm-hmm. good. Bad Raymond Chandler. Mm-hmm. But then within that framework of the society, there's a recognition uh, when he's like, he's saying that Carol Lundgren is like, avoids the police when he's like hiding Geiger's body and stuff. And Marlowe says he's afraid of the police being what he is. Mm-hmm. And there seems to be a recognition that there is an unfair treatment of. Does that make sense? Maybe. Like, I know. I'm, I'm fumbling around and like, or maybe just because, not, not even necessarily unfair treatment, but just the illegality of homosexual conduct at the time. That's fair, yeah. I think that's more, that's what I read that as, is like just having his things and being evidently Geiger's boyfriend would be enough for him to be arrested. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. I know, it's it's not it's not a great look. Yeah. Within the book in general. Um, it's, it's pretty problematic. Yeah. Like, Geiger is characterized as being bisexual in his behavior, if not his romantic relationship. At some point, they call him a husband to women and a wife to men. Yeah. So. Maybe. Like, they definitely imply that he has female lovers as well. So. I didn't get the... I don't get the impression from much in the book that, like, he that he has female lovers so much as he takes advantage of women in certain ways. Mm. But maybe I'm wrong. I felt the line a husband to women and a wife to men was Well there's a reference about Caesar in there as well. Yeah, but there was they were comparing Geiger to Yeah. Him, like saying that he was like Yeah that. Okay. So, like he seems to be bisexual but have a but his partner is male. Yeah. One grin. Um but there's also some there's some ambiguity about whether or not Carol Lundgren is actually an adult or not, or he, if he is an adult, like a very young adult, they keep calling him boy. Yeah. But he, I think he's also described to me as an Asian man from my reading of the description of him. And so that could also be part of the negative Asian stereotypes about Asian men being less masculine. So that could be part of it. So it's hard to say. But also, like, if he is very young, Geiger is much older than him, that also shows a a different kind of very unhealthy relationship where you have this much older man taking advantage of and kind of keeping this much younger man who's also, you know, part of an ethnic minority that's discriminated against in this community. But either way, the relationship, there's some weirdness there because Geiger's apartment and things like he clearly fetishizes asian culture and is like part of this whole like fascination with oriental style and then him having a young asian boyfriend it all feels very gross yeah um like, it's they like don't a share, trophy they don't share a bedroom so it's almost as though like 
that's that's your bedroom where I keep you when everyone else comes over, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that Geiger wears like sort of quotes traditional Western garb when he's out and about, and then like the description of what he's found in when he's dead at home is all like he's wearing like quotes Oriental attire, and he has yeah. There's definitely some fetishization in like the way he, that that whole thing is described. Yeah. Do do we have anything to say about this other than it's problematic? I do think it's interesting that Marlowe is so judgmental of home of like homosexual relationships and you know says all of these things about gay guys but also there's some implication to me that I think I think there are some questions about his sexuality that we could ask. There's yeah. an interesting quote when he's like kind of out of it like he's taken a head blow. Yeah. And he's kind of waking up a little bit. I do do want to just put a quick little note in that, like, we are reading this with today's eyes. Yeah. And, like, there's an extent to which I think that maybe the reason that there's so much anti-homosexuality from Marlowe is because there was a lot of anti-homosexuality. Yeah. He's just sort of waking up from a blow to the head. And he says, And don't scatter my ashes over the blue Pacific. I like the worms better. Did you know that worms are of both sexes and that any worm can love any other worm? And... I just thought that was a very strange line, especially, like, apropos of nothing. He he has this sense of disgust when talking about homosexuality prior to this, but also consistently reiterates the lack of power women's bodies have over him and how, like, yeah, they're pretty and stuff, but it's, like, it's this very aesthetic appreciation and he makes comments like women always were astonished when they discover that their bodies aren't irresistible. Yeah, them. that's that's what it was. When they discover their bodies aren't irresistible, especially nice looking women. And it's just this like feeling removed from that power and from that yeah. attraction and then just the disgust Although there's the there's this disgust and feeling of being violated when Carmen breaks into his house and takes off her clothes and is in his bed and there's just there's a lot of description there about how upsetting he finds it. If this and, is my space. But I think that a big part of that is just that she's violated his space, but the degree of revulsion could potentially also be tied into that. I don't know. I feel like that could go either way, but I do want did want to mention it. But so I don't know, it just seems like he's got some, there's some questions there about his attraction to women and his revulsion to the idea of male attraction. It's an interesting read. Fortunately, Mar um, Chandler wrote seven more books with Marlowe in, mm -hmm. so we could go and read those and see if we think that holds up across the books. But taking this book as one thing, I can certainly see your point. It's interesting that the fo first sort of quote disguise that Marlowe puts on is in Geiger's shop. Mm -hmm. as being gay. Yeah. And there's some problematic language in there, but it... Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's interesting. But I feel like some of the problematic language that comes into it is there's certain members of the LGBT community who have a revulsion for people who seem gay. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, like, this notion of, you know, you, you should just be who you are and like, you don't need to play into these roles. Like, you don't need rainbows everywhere and everything mm -hmm. and you can be a man and be gay and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the sort of like more problematic language that is used, it's always things like a pansy has mm -hmm. no, no straight, um, iron in his bones and he talks about like if a fairy could do this, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of a certain view of homosexuality. So I don't know if I'm making a compelling argument, but maybe you could argue that the issue he has is with people who seem gay. So, well, in that case, that would be more that he has a problem with effeminate men. Right, and that might be um, something we could argue. Um, I do think it's interesting, there's a little sort of, at least in our version of The Big Sleep, there's a little sort of bio of Philip Marlowe, which I think is taken from somewhere, I'm not certain exactly where, but I think it is by Chandler, and it's done in the first person, so it's... Here we go. So Sternwood says to Marlowe in their first meeting... Tell me about yourself, Mr. Marlowe. I suppose I have a right to ask. Sure, but there's very little to tell. I'm 33 years old, went to college once, and can still speak English if there's any demand for it. There isn't much in my trade. 
I worked for Mr. Wilde, the district attorney, as an investigator once. His chief investigator, a man named Bernie Olds, called me and told me you wanted to see me. I'm unmarried because I don't like policemen's wives. That's the note on it. That's it. Which I feel is, like, an interesting party line to trot out as an excuse, perhaps? Yeah. So I, I, I think that you might you may have a point. Mm-hmm. Whether Chandler intended that to be something you can read into it, I don't know. But I, I'm, I'm willing to believe the reading. Mm-hmm. As a sort of counterpoint to that, should we talk about women for a minute? Sure, yeah. There's definitely a lot of misogyny in here, and all of the women in this story are terrible. You don't need to narrow it down to the women. Everyone in the story is terrible. You're right. Everyone in the story is terrible. Except Harry Jones. Yeah, who gets killed. Yes. Um, His only characterization is that he is trying to help out a woman. Yeah. That is it. Yeah. Like, there's several instances of, like, slapping women to, like, wake Carmen up from her drug-induced stupor or whatever. Which she apparently seems to like, which seems like projecting. Yeah, but there's also... Other points when slapping women and slapping your wife is excused by Marlowe, or if not excused, like, he's somewhat sympathetic to it. Yeah. And it's... That's that's not okay. It's not okay. I think this is another point where, and I'm not excusing this in any way, but, like, it is... How much we read into it as a commentary on Marlowe is going to be mm-hmm. difficult because, like, that's something that some people still think is okay, and, like, I know... One of the issues I have with Sean Connery is that he thinks it's okay to slap your wife. Mm-hmm. Um, like, yeah. There's also a lot of women using their sexuality as a weapon or to manipulate people. Like that happens constantly. Well, there's that's one of the things that I come down to with this is like three different women in this book throw themselves at Marlowe mm-hmm. to some degree or another. It's either some awkward as hell wish fulfillment. <laughs> Where Chandler's just like, well, personally, if I was this private detective, uh, you know, women would just want to kiss me all the time, and they'd be naked in my bed, it would be great. Except that Marlowe doesn't think it's great, he hates it, he finds it really distressing and upsetting. Or to, or just... For Carmen, yes. The stuff yeah. with Vivian, I think less so. The stuff with Vivian, I feel like he's just kind of playing along with her. Yeah. And I think that that's him toying with her because she's trying to toy with him. And just essentially proving to her that it's not this tactic isn't gonna work. Like he'll play along for a bit, but only for his own reasons, and not really because of her. Like that it's not about her. It's a way of reasserting power as she's trying to assert power. So yeah, what I come down to is it's either wish fulfillment or it's women using sexuality as a weapon because it's the weapon that they have in the twenties and thirties. Yes, I agree with that. But, and then you also see that kind of taken to this extreme with the sexual harassment and stalking of Marlowe by Car- by Carmen. Mm-hmm. She breaks into his house, like we've mentioned this before, and I I really appreciated how his reaction to that was detailed and characterized. Because I, I feel like that sense of being violated and your space no longer being your own and just feeling disgusted in a lot of ways and just having a hard time shaking that feeling off and like getting past it was very relatable and we just had a friend who had her place broken into and you know described a lot of those same feelings of just like you feel like your house is no longer yours it's hard to feel safe it's it's violating um and i i appreciate them showing Him being so shaken, particularly because he's characterized as this very masculine, you know, intimidating person who is totally willing to risk his own life and things like that. Like, he has a a stronger reaction to that, to Carmen sexually harassing and assaulting him, than he does to, you know, people attempting to shoot him or being taken prisoner. He does have a reaction to that, but it's not the same emotional response. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of different things I want to talk about, which are going to go take some very different directions. Um, and some of this is just that sort of I want to get your take on it. Coleman is... And like, I don't know to what extent this is part of what puts Marlowe off so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm still leaving a question mark over the homosexuality side of things. Mm-hmm. Like, I have another challenge for you on that in a minute. But whether part of what puts it off so much about Carmen is that she is described as so infantile. Yeah. And I don't know if she's intended to be in some way 
whether it's that she always gets her way because she's the unattended daughter of a rich man, mm-hmm. or whether it's because she's supposed to be in some way developmentally delayed because of epilepsy, and that's something we're supposed to be able to read into it. Any thoughts? Well, she's definitely spoiled, and I think a big part of why, like, they really build on her childlike look and behavior. Like, she sucks her thumb a lot, and her verbal skills are very limited. And I do think that the juxtaposition of her being so childlike, but also so having such sexual agency, but also being taken advantage of in a lot of ways, like, it's all meant to to be juxtaposed in a very disturbing way. The epilepsy thing is weird. Like, I think they do hint at it before they show it completely at the end by talking about how weird her eyes look and, like, how dazed she is a lot of the time and how out of it she is a lot of the time. But I don't think they make that very clear. Like, there's just something off about her. Well, there's that weird, like, animalistic hissing that she does. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I think it's very weird. Like, I don't think it's a particularly fair portrayal of someone with epilepsy. No, I'm sure I it think isn't. that it's, like, whatever's going on with Carmen, it's a combination of things. She's spoiled. She maybe had has brain damage from very serious epilepsy over time. A lot of people grow out of it when they're young, and she apparently didn't. And if your epilepsy is bad enough and you don't get it treated, it can cause brain damage. Yeah. So there might be some delays or disabilities there for her because of that. And maybe some impulse control issues, especially if it's like frontal lobe damage, which maybe it is. But I think that the whole thing, because you just don't really get enough detail, it just ends up being kind of a ham-handed, this is a creepy, childlike, sex-crazed woman who murders people who won't sleep with her. Yeah. Like, she really is part of a horror movie. Like, I feel like she's somewhat out of place in this story. You know what I mean? I I get that, yeah. Like, Um, she's this creepy doll girl. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about Eddie Mars' wife, Mm -hmm. that Chandler does eventually remember to give a name. Do you remember what it is? Nope. Precisely. (laughs) Do you remember another name? Mona? Yeah, Mona Mona is her name, um, Mm -hmm. but she's also just referred to as Silverwig. Yeah. Which, I guess at this point, like, Marlo's taken a blow to the head, so maybe he's just clasping for what he can remember. I think that maybe maybe we just forgot to give this character a name for a little bit too long. But uh, there's a few things with her. The first thing I want to touch on was uh, her relationship with her husband. Mm-hmm. And the whole, like, oh, he's not a killer. Yeah. And then Marlo's like, well, he's got this guy who kills people. He's like, uh, but no, 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 he's not a killer. But you know I need to get away from here because if I don't, then the guy that works from will come back and kill me. And she's like, yeah, but he's up. Oh. And there's just sort of like this level of denial and this assertion, oh, no, I love him. Mm-hmm. That's this almost sort of like Stockholm Syndrome abusive relationship kind of thing. Or like willfully looking away. It's like, the, I mean, that she's a mob wife. Mm. You know, and she's like, yeah, but, you know, the person I know doesn't do these terrible things. I'm just gonna not think too hard about the fact that he has other people to do them for him. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, that does seem to break, like, at the end in, like, the DA's house. Like, she doesn't respond to him and things. But but I want to talk about um, more directly the, like, relationship between her and Marlo. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I think that that maybe casts a problem on your, like, homosexuality theory. Yeah. Because... Okay, the easier part of this is that, like, one of the last lines of the book is that he ki- is still thinking about her. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, implies a certain level of fun. I don't know. Maybe he's concerned. But whatever. But there's also the really weird... Like, I just have in my notes capitalised in my own handwriting, weird, like, the sort of kiss scene with her, mm. where he, like, insists upon it. Maybe? And there's a weird line about it being rehearsed. You're looking at me blankly, so I'm going to read the passage. Okay. Despite the fact that it makes me kind of uncomfortable and is extremely weird. So he is handcuffed with his hands behind his back and running out of a place where someone is going to come back and kill him if he doesn't get away and she's helping him escape but not going with him. Uh, And they just got to the door. And I leaned against her and pressed her against the wall with my body. I pushed my mouth against her face. I talked to her that way. 
There's no hurry. All this was arranged in advance, rehearsed to the last detail, timed to the split second, just like a radio program. No hurry at all. Kiss me, Silverwig. Her face under my mouth was like ice. She put her hands up and took hold of my head and kissed me hard on the lips. Her lips were like ice, too. Discuss! Yeah, that whole thing is really weird. I think that it probably does support the not actually sexually interested in women thing. Like, this feels like a thing that is very performative. Mm, you think it's more of that, like, um, that he, he he's doing this because it's what the movies have told him to do? Yeah. Okay. Like, it seems like the thing you do when this person is helping you escape, but neither of them really want to do this, and so it's just super weird. Yeah. I I don't necessarily think that um, Marlo, um, like, is gay, but I think, like, I think there's an equal amount of support for him being asexual and just not being interested in sex or really getting it. Like, having some aesthetic appreciation for humans and for, like, like, kissing is nice, he says at one point. But, like, I don't know, it, he seems to have a hard time understanding anything beyond that without just getting upset. Yeah. Yeah, you make a fair point. Hmm. And that could also support him, like, not wanting to get married if he's had problems with relationships where people wanted sexual relationships and he just was not really into it. Yeah, I know. I'm willing to believe your reading. I don't necessarily... I don't know. I'm not saying it's my reading. I'm saying I can see support for him either having some internalized homophobia and actually being gay, but pushing that down because of social situations where it's like... You know, because there's the worms thing. It's like where any worm can love any other worms. So that might be him just repressing his sexuality because he knows it would cause a whole lot of problems for him in society. Or it could be that he has an inherent disinterest or distaste for sex and also feels judged and marginalized by that. And so just sort of avoids the whole thing. With some of your supporting evidence and the fact that this was written in 1939 and things were so repressed in those regards at the time. I am very tempted to read an awful lot into that worms line, mm -hmm. if only for my own amusement. Mm -hmm. Um so so yeah, I'll I'll go with it. But but he's he's not cishet. We'll go with that. Yeah, I mean I, I think that there's definitely stuff in there that points in that direction. I'm not making it like a definitive reading or anything, but Is that our unrambling's hot take for the evening? Yeah. Marlowe is not cishet. Yep. Okay. Are we moving on to our next thing? Um, well, we were kind of talking around it with the stuff about Carmen, but yeah, I think we can both agree that the characterization of this person with a seizure disorder and possibly other mental illnesses is not good, um, TM, because, like, <laughs> you're, it's this person who has this, you know, serious brain disorder that is being painted as a murderer and a threat to society and to the people around her when most of the time people with mental illnesses and other, like, serious disabilities, which this does seem to be a disabling condition for her, like, people with disabilities and people with mental, mental illnesses are far and away more likely to be the victims of violent crime than the perpetrators of violent crime. So that that is definitely, I feel, an issue in, in this book. Yeah, and I think it's... There's a trope within private detective, mm -hmm. um, like, non-police investigators mm -hmm. of letting someone get away with something mm -hmm. for a reason. And, like, I'm pretty... I think that there's a couple of home stories that do it. Poirot certainly does it at one point, um, which are both prior to the... or at least some of the Poirot stories are prior to this, um, which is Agatha Christie, for anyone who doesn't know that. I don't know who wouldn't know that. But that's because I'm a snob. Um, I might not have known that. The part was written by Agatha Christie? Yeah. So you've not been listening to me for the past seven years. I'm I mean, I might a little have, upset. I might have known, I might not have known. It would have Eight years. if I had Eight remembered. Years, Whether there's an extent to which being able to pass it off within a narrative form as it being a mental illness rather than her being evil mm -hmm. allows, to some extent, for Marlo to let the general save face. Mm -hmm. And, like, sort of let him die in peace not knowing. Yeah. Because Marlowe is in a position where he makes that decision to not follow up on that. Mm -hmm. And there's that doesn't just mean that there's no legal consequences for Carmen. 
it also means that he doesn't get a thousand dollars for a man for whom a thousand dollars is a lot of money mm-hmm. like he instead chooses to i really the only reason for it as far as i can see is to let the general not worry about it before he dies yeah so like i i don't think it's good that mental health is drawn in that way i wonder if that's part of the reason is that it means that it can just sort of be hand waved well it might be just it because it's the neatest way to reinforce moral reasoning as marlo's highest form of reasoning yeah because it's the last thing in the book so it's like the last strong impression you have of him and his character and the way he calls the shots and you see him prioritize his internal sense of right and wrong of like it being wrong to ruin the general's last days like this even though doing so telling him what happened that his daughter killed his son-in-law is the remit of that he of his job like that would be the call to make according to his ethics he was hired to find out what happened to Regan. He found out what happened to Regan. He's supposed to tell his employer and get the money. That's how that whole thing works. And definitely above the legal yeah, the legal correct thing to do, which would be to report her to the police and, you know, have the state file charges against her for the murder of Regan. And you'd get Vivian in on a conspiracy and possibly Eddie Miles as well. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think this is a case of a fairer representation of mental illness and disability being kind of sacrificed for the characterization circling back to that moral, ethical, legal reasoning as as a central part of his character and who he is. But at the same time, like, what Chandler knows about mental health and what mental health advocacy is going on at the time, I don't think was great. Sure, um, and also understanding of epilepsy. I don't know how great it was at that point. We were still at a point of, like... Oh, you have a person with a mental health issue in your family? You should probably get an attic. <laughs> like, well, No, and... we're at a hospital. And that's what Marlo wants her to do, is take her to a hospital where she can be taken care of and maybe cured? At yes. least be monitored and not able to kill people. Yes. Okay. Anything else on that topic? I don't think so. So I know we talked a little bit about how much money you have defining how the police treat you. Mm -hmm. But I did want to talk about money a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Just sort of how money and class is portrayed in the book. We open the book on, like, Marlowe describing how he's dressed up in his best gear Mm -hmm. because he's calling on $4 million. Mm -hmm. 1939, $4 million is a lot of money. I mean, $4 million is still a lot of money. We would almost pay off our student debt. (laughs) Um... (sighs) But he's calling on this family that's made its money from oil, and you can see the old oil fields from their very large house where there's a butler and a maid and all this jazz. And a greenhouse, and yeah. Yes, fancy greenhouse with orchids mm-hmm. and champagne and brandy. Yep. Did you wanna? Did you have anything you wanted to say about this, or am I just gonna ramble for a while? Um, there was some. There was a quote about fifteen thousand mm. dollars on um that I thought was interesting, just because it. Just, like, he's talking about all of the things that he could have in his life if he had $15,000. And it's just, like, making me think of how much further money is to go, basically. <clears throat> but to be fair, he also got paid $25 a day. Yeah. But he's, like, saying with $15,000 I could have a house and a... a... car and four suits. Yeah. And to go on vacation without worrying about losing a case and... Just like, yeah, $15,000 would not be enough for that stuff now. See, that's not the biggest thing I take from that rant. Mm -hmm. Because... I mean, it really does boil down to being more about class and inequality and income inequality. But Yeah, well, he it's also just like talking about his quality of person to some degree. Yeah. Because Vivian's effectively asking him how much for you to keep quiet about Carmen. Mm -hmm. And he... um, and she offers $15,000, and he sort of plays along with the idea of accepting it, mm-hmm. and sort of taunts her a little bit about Eddie Mars, and she calls him a son of a bitch for it. Mm-hmm. And it's his response to that. It's it's are a you, long passage, otherwise I'd just read it. But. Are you talking about, like, yeah, because she offers him money, and he's like well, how much do you think that would cost or whatever? And, like, he's, I think, just trying to... He's just being judgy, but she takes it as, like, you know, actually opening a negotiation, and she asks if he's getting at the number $15,000 because that's how much money 
Regan always had on him as, like, his emergency, like, walking money. And he's, like, taunting her, as you said, about, yeah, I guess that would be the going rate. That's how much you must have given Eddie Mars to keep, you know, your sister's first murder quiet. So I guess that's the established fee that you should give me for if you want me to keep it quiet. But he's, he's actually just throwing it in her face. It's not a genuine negotiation on his part and she is then pissed at him about this because she's like you're gonna ruin she's mad at him for essentially threatening to ruin her and her sister's life her sister's reputation and he's like no no no, i'm not the asshole here you're the one who let your sister get away with murder and like let her go on being able to hurt people and you think i am the asshole like what the fuck let, let me read this and we can cut out some of it, because, um, or just let, just so we can have it fresh in our minds, if nothing else. No, I know the passage you're talking about. Well, that's why I just want to read it. Okay, you just read it then. You son of a bitch, she said. Uh-huh, I'm a very smart guy. I haven't a feeling or a scruple in the world. All I have the itch for is money. I am so money greedy that for 25 bucks a day in expenses, mostly gasoline and whiskey, I do my thinking myself, what there is of it. I risk my whole future, the hatred of the cops and of Eddie Mars and his pals. I dodge bullets and eat saps and say thank you very much. If you have any more trouble, I hope you'll think of me. I'll I'll just leave one of my cards in case anything comes up. I do all this for 25 bucks a day, and maybe just a little to protect what little pride a broken and sick old man has left in his blood, in the thought that his blood is not poison, and that although his two little girls are a trifle wild, as many nice girls are these days, they are not perverts or killers. And that makes me a son of a bitch. All right, I don't care about that. I've been called that by people of all sizes and shapes, including your little sister. She called me worse than that for not getting into bed with her. I got $500 from your father, which I didn't ask for, but he can afford to give it to me. I can get another thousand for finding Mr. Rusty Reagan, if I could find him. Now you offer me 15 grand. That makes me a big shot. With 15 grand, I could own a home and a new car and four suits of clothes. I might even take a vacation without worrying about losing a case. That's fine. What are you offering it to me for? Can I go on being a son of a bitch, or do I have to become a gentleman like that lush that passed out in his car the other night? The guy who had escorted her to the yeah to the casino. This is him calling her out on her hypocrisy of being like, you're calling me an asshole because I'm inconveniencing you. You're the one who's actually being a bad person. <laughs> and, yeah. you know... In some ways implying that she is a bad person because she has always had money to throw around and get whatever she wanted. Whereas he's like, no, if I were, if I were greedy, I wouldn't be in the business I'm in. You know, I... I'd be taking that thousand dollars and telling the yeah. guy what what happened to his son-in-law. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't make him happy. It's not what he wants. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm choosing not to do that to him. For a thousand dollars, which would be a lot of money to me. I'm doing my best to be a good person. Yeah. Like, there's a, I have a note of um, just like the, one of the points when it becomes clear, like of the divide between Vivian and Marlo, like they've been going around together on fairly level footing. And then he says, yeah. And she says, don't say yeah, it's common. Mm-hmm. And it just sort of like, I know, builds a wall there suddenly. Yeah. I think it's an interesting bit of divide. This is when they're heading back from the casino when he's taking her home. Because yeah. her current her previous ride was too passed out yeah. uh, to take her home. And he's being a gentleman. Yeah. And it's like, okay, here I am, you know, doing you a favor and you are essentially talking down to me and trying to change who I am as a person because of your classist bullshit. It's like, yeah, I will say what I want to say. <laughs> and I think that all kind of points to the difference in what they value. Like, Vivian values appearances, and she has internalized this this sense of her values are, like, that if she can get away with it, it's fine, I guess. And she kind of acknowledges the evils in the world and also, like, of her family, but just tries, in a similar way, I think, to Mona, to just not look at them too hard and just sort of perennially distract herself from the things that she knows are wrong in the world and in her own actions, whereas Marlo refuses to do that. Yeah. And I think there's a decent extent to which you can say that, like, Marlo's job in the book is to walk around and show people a mirror. Yeah. It's like, this is how you sound. Mm-hmm. Sort of thing. Yeah. Do you realize how out of touch you are? Do you realize how selfish you're being? 
you know, do you realize how you are a shitty human being? Yeah. Okay, so I think that takes us down to some stuff I want to talk about with, like, the genre and the narration, how it was written, mm-hmm. and the fact that Marlowe keeps investigating. And I think the fact that he keeps investigating, we've probably touched on a bit with, like, some of the moral and ethical sort of things. Yeah. I think it's probably going to lead us into this stuff soon. I think it's interesting that Marlowe gets hired to do a job. Yep. And by halfway through the book, as you say, he has he's done that job. Yep. Um, he's been paid for it, in fact. Mm-hmm. And then there's half a book more. Yep. And in the course of completing that job, he also solves two murders. Mm-hmm. Like, someone's like, hey, this guy wants some money for these IOUs, effectively. Can you get him to lay off? Sure. Goes solving crimes. He ends up following up on Reagan when he has no client. We know that Marlowe doesn't have a lot of money and that he's worried about missing a case, but he's mm-hmm. out looking for someone because he has this idea that it's what the general wants on some level there's no idea that he'll get paid for it Mm -hmm. it's just a i know i think he takes a bit of a liking to the general on some level Mm -hmm. wants to complete that task as he sees fit perhaps a bit of curiosity on his own part because people keep being like oh you're looking for this guy no i think that it's more his own curiosity and in some ways he finds the justification after the fact within the ethics of his job. And I think because that's how people usually make decisions, like just in terms of the way that the brain works, people make a decision based on a whole lot of subconscious factors and feelings and past experience. And then they rationalize it afterward using the structures that we've learned, you know? Yeah. So I think he, I think people keep talking about it. And so he keeps thinking about it and you don't become a private investigator if you're not a curious person who likes to unravel things. So yeah. I think it just, it hooks him. And so he's, he finds a reason to keep looking into it. And to support that, like he, cause one of the things that turned me away from it just being his curiosity is that he gives the general this long explanation of like, well, you mm-hmm. know, I feel that if I'm going to do a job, I've got to do it properly. And I decide mm-hmm. when that ends and not you as such. Mm-hmm. But when the general has said, why did you go and see Captain Gregory, the head of Mrs. Persons, which is mm-hmm. sort of where that part of the book really takes off. He sort of thinks about it and doesn't know. He doesn't have an answer to give the general and then gives him this other answer that, yeah. as you say, seems like kind of a justification on his own part. Yeah. I mean, and that's just how brains work. Yeah. Keep, that's what people, that's how a lot of ethical reasoning happens is there's a gut feeling. There's a decision that's made. Like you can see this, you can see the decisions being made with like imaging and EEG and things. And then the justifications afterward. Like, huh. you, you can have, like, well, you'll see the parts of the brain that are, like, emotional, and then, like, when the point where people are explaining their reason, it's different parts of the brain that are involved in that, in the explanation. Interesting. And there are, like, certain factors of a decision that will trip different parts of your brain, like, whether other people are involved or whether you would yourself have to do specific things. It's it's interesting stuff. That you could really we could really go down a whole rabbit hole. But I'm just telling you, like when it comes to these kinds of decisions, a lot of the time people make a gut decision and then they justify it afterward. Yeah, and I think that there's a point at which I think it becomes personal for Marlowe, and he's like, can he go like when he goes to see Canino and ends up killing him? Like I think that has stopped being curiosity. Like I think he's he knows what's going on at that point. Mm-hmm. but it's the revenge for Harry Jones. You killed this guy, you didn't need to, it was cold-blooded, this guy was just trying to help people. And he sort of seems to have a sort of... When he first meets Harry, like he sort of brushes him off, so I think there's a part of guilt there. Yeah. But there's also a sort of vague respect for him because like he didn't sell out Agnes to... Mm-hmm. Oh, we didn't talk about Agnes. We'll do that back hands that. And again, it's something that like you see throughout the genre is that there's, in a lot of stories, there's a logical point at which the investigator should stop investigating. Mm -hmm. Like, there's whatever, like, their client has said stop, or they found out the answer to part of the riddle, and that's fine, and there is a threat of physical violence if they continue, Mm -hmm. but they do it anyway. Mm -hmm. It's, It's the, when, it's in that cop show when, in the movies, where the captain says, give me your gun and your badge, you're off the case! (laughs) But it's personal now, so or like he's got to know, so he goes and investigates anyway. Yeah, like this is that's what this is and what it is mm-hmm. in a lot of things. I don't know if you ever read my undergraduate thesis. So I'm not sure why I did I read would... your. I did read your undergraduate. My thesis. my critical one, not my creative. I think I did. I 
Yeah, I think so. The premise I had for that was looking at violence yeah. in these sorts of stories, and the way that I went, how am I looking at just the violence and not the commitment to it, was looking at stories where the non-cop figure should stop investigating but keeps going. Mm -hmm. Um... So I think that sort of like line between it being personal and the curiosity is interesting. Like, it's definitely the point at which Marlowe should go home and have a drink. Mm -hmm. Like, no and, one would fault him for it. And I think that is an important part of the storytelling. It, I think it's an important part of making it clear that the story is compelling and like nagging at the investigator that there's more to it. Because if it weren't why would it be worth it to keep going? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, they're telling you that this is weird and worth following up on because they're showing someone who cannot help but follow up on it. Yeah. And I think that that's um, kind of shown nicely through... Um, there's this sort of recurring theme of knights throughout the book. So knights and gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Like, the, one of the first things that we see in the book is that stained glass window of the knight trying to untie the untie the naked woman and not getting anywhere with it. Mm -hmm. um, which actually sort of bookends the piece. Yeah. And there's the Marlowe being like, if I lived here, eventually I'd have to climb up there and help him. Mm -hmm. And it's the, like, I think that's supposed to be a symbol of, like, a worthy cause of trying to help people, mm -hmm. but also kind of fruitless. Yeah. And it, when you get to the end of the book, like, he, it's almost fruitless. Like, he's not really able to get anywhere with the information that he's gained. Yeah, he solved the murder, but he can't do anything with solving it that would be okay with his own conscience. He's sort of this knight in terms of doing the right thing and adhering to this code. Like at the beginning, when he rescues Carmen from Geiger's place, he's like trying to dress her and bring her home and, you know, to someone who can take care of her. And then the same thing, even when she's invaded his house... And is, you know, sexually harassing him. He still, like, tries to be as gentlemanly as possible. And, like, you need to get dressed and you need to get out of my house. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take advantage of you in this way or in any way. And you need to leave. Yeah. Because he's got um, a chessboard in his apartment that has got, mm -hmm. like, some, like, a problem laid out on it that he's trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And, like, when, at the start of that scene, he moves a knight mm -hmm. as part of the action. And then when he's got fed up and just needs to get Carmen out of his place, mm -hmm. he, like, puts the knight back and makes the comment that it's not a game for knights. Yeah, and I definitely felt like that was a commentary on the larger role he has in society and who he how he feels his work is being received. It's just, like, as thankless, the way you were talking about before, and somewhat fruitless, and... He's trying to be noble, and it's not getting him anywhere. It's only getting... It's that monologue again about, you know, being a son... Of, you know, being called a son of a bitch for trying to do the right thing, being called greedy when he's risking his life to safeguard other people's feelings for, like, a pittance. Yeah. So as... Just a couple of tidying up points before we go into talking about some of the storytelling stuff. I wanted to just touch back to, I meant to talk about um, Agnes earlier when we were talking about the women in the story. Mm -hmm. So she's the woman that was working in Geiger's shop and has like, teamed up with Brody afterwards to try and still make the racket work. And then Harry Jones is trying to get her out of town afterwards. Agnes says that she got a raw deal and Marla replies like hell you did. Yeah, because Geiger got killed and Brody got killed. And it's just like, you're saying you got a raw deal because you're having to run out of town. Your partners in these enterprises are dead now. Well, yeah, it's um, he, he goes on in his own little monologue to himself. Three men dead, Geiger, Brody, and Harry Jones. And the woman went riding off in the rain with my 200 in her bag and not a mark on her. Which I guess ignores the fact that he punches her in the head earlier on in the book. But, but not enough to leave a mark. There we go. That's the important thing. I guess. In his mind. Yeah. In vague self-defense, but, yeah. but still. Yeah. Um, I just thought that was an interesting note. So when it comes to how the story is told, um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was um, the way that, like, theories are presented. In, like, Marlowe tends to sort of spitball ideas as sort of a way of Chandler suggesting to the reader various things that might have been the case. Mm -hmm. Marlowe will sort of say to someone... Oh, well, it could have been this, or it could have been this, or we'll like draw out this interesting version of events that could be the case, or could not be. And you see it quite a few times throughout. Mm 
um, which I think is just interesting as a way for keeping the audience on the same page and thinking about what it could be and going, oh, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. Sure. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the end of the Clue movie. Yeah. Are they like, they actually show you a bunch of different potential things. Yeah. And it's um, it's interesting because like more traditionally with Holmes, with some of the Agatha Christie mysteries and stuff, there's like a sidekick there to have things explained to them. Mm-hmm. Um, you have John Watson standing there for Holmes to go, aha, well, because there was dust on his sleeve, it must mm-hmm. mean this. Yeah. Or it could mean this. Whereas here, you Marlowe doesn't have a sidekick. So he just explains it to random people on the street. Well, I think, no, not to random people on the street. No. To the potential people involved in the crime. Yes. Like, he's trying to call them out on it and see their reaction. And that's also how he ends up adjusting his theories based on their responses. So it's it's not even just a theory. It's also a probing. It's part of the investigation is the semi-wrapping up of the investigation and seeing how the villain responds yeah which is something that again you do see repeated a lot like it becomes the um the mystery version of the interaction between the spy and the supervillain. whereas you know instead of the villain monologuing the plan it's the spy going or the the detective who's been captured by the bad guy um going ah, you thought you were so clever with this exact situation, and then the villain can be like, you're almost right, but you got this one small thing wrong, and like, they, and they can gloat, you know? And that just becomes a thing, and it's, I guess, started here. Well, I, it's sort of around this time, because it's certainly a thing in, like, there's the getting everyone together in the library, in the sort of more, that's more of an Agatha Christie thing, mm-hmm. where you get everyone together, and then you steadily go through accusing everyone, and then going, aha, but it wasn't that because of this. Mm-hmm. And on to the next person. You can get everyone pissed off. Yeah. And really mess with the audience. Except Marlowe's doing it a little bit more concisely because he's only doing it to one villain at a time. <laughs> yes. Yes. Doesn't doesn't have the power to get everyone in one place as easily. Um, yeah. Really, that, ha- that can only happen in English country houses. Mm. <laughs> During, like, blizzards or whatever environmental situation is keeping everyone from leaving. Ideally. If you can manage to get it to be a blizzard on a train, you get extra marks for that. But uh... Yeah. The monologue about what must have happened or might have happened, I feel like is one of the more lampshaded or obvious parts of an ongoing story- storytelling or narrative device where you kind of are getting the story in a stream of consciousness of details of like Marlowe's observations and private thoughts that also serve to direct the flow of information to the reader in a way that serves the story so that they don't have all of the details too soon and so that they might have confusing details at at time at a you know suspenseful moments and things like that and i i just think it's it's neatly done in that like you're not really sure what of the often very weird and specific details marlowe's noticed are actually going to be relevant at some point or not there's a set of false teeth in this lobby. That must be important. No. It's mentioned twice, and it's really weird. So, what? But, nope, totally, and doesn't get mentioned again. It's just to characterize the building as creepy and move along. Chandler allows himself quite a lot of time at places to sit and just build an atmosphere for a place. And I wonder about the influence of cinema on that. Because he mm. does kind of seem to be trying to paint a very compelling and like visual picture a lot of the details are setting a scene in a very visual way i thought anyway i i agree that they're setting the scene in a very visual way i wonder whether it's actually the reverse and whether it's that there's less cinema around. like i think that i would say that in more modern writing there is less patience for those descriptions i'm speaking very generally and you're giving me a look well, I read fantasy, so... Right, and George, when, when George R. R. Meissen spends three chapters on a feast, people take note because it's not what they're used to. If they'd read Dickens recently... Th- yes, I'm drive buying Dickens again. <laughs> um, then they wouldn't even blink an eye at it. I think because people have got a much better idea of what a general scene looks like in general, you can say a house in L.A., and many more people have seen a TV show with a house in LA than not at this point. So you can just say that and just sort of let their imagination fill in the rest. I don't know. 
know. I felt like it was it's carefully calling attention to specific details in a way that like is very cinematographic. Mm. Interesting. I don't know. I don't have a complete thesis on that idea yet. But mm-hmm. I mean, there's certainly times pre-cinema that there are people doing that. I would say. Sure. But just as an, a part of that, making sure that the reader has the information they need to be effectively managed through the story for their perspective to sort of be shepherded along and for them to be surprised by the right things and upset by the right things and, you know, feel smart in the right moments and things, if that makes sense. I think the other part of it that, um, like, the sort of flow of information that at least is amusing in this book for me is the way that everyone thinks they know what Marlowe's about and what he's investigating mm-hmm. and they're trying to manipulate him, but not very successfully. And largely because they're wrong, they're like, ah... You must be looking for Rusty Reagan, and he's like, "Must I?" <laughs> Nobody's asked me to, or something. And they're like, "Ah, you are." And if you were looking for him, you should know. Mm-hmm. Dot dot dot. And like in there, trying to steer him in certain directions and manipulate him on something he's not actually trying to do, just end up providing him a lot of information that he needs mm-hmm. without him having to hunt for it as much. Yeah. It's interesting. Chandler, I think I really like his writing when he's not being mildly racist. Or misogynist or homophobic. Yeah, or potentially anti-Semitic. Um, anyway, his writing itself and tone, like there, there's some really beautiful phrases throughout there. Mm-hmm. I think one of the ways that he uses those really nicely is in um, giving a really weird, unique description of someone or an aspect of them, mm-hmm. and then calling back to it verbatim later. I think the most notable one is um, talking about Canino's voice. Mm-hmm. that he hears but doesn't see him originally and then mm-hmm. hears it again later which he describes as a purring voice like a small dynamo held behind a wall which is so specific that when he calls back to it you're like well yes that was the one one time anyone has ever used that phrase it was right here so i know who that is mm-hmm. without you having to go ah, i must have been the guy that killed harry jones mm-hmm. which i just thought was an interesting device mm-hmm there are also a lot of n- uh, nice turns of phrase that are c- definitely larger commentaries or observations of like a type of person. There's one time when he is talking about a guy who's threatening him. I think it's Joe Brody. And it seems to think a gat in the hand means a world by the tail. Mm. And it's just like, that is a whole huge group of people. It's just like... Yeah, you're one of those guys who thinks everyone is as afraid of death as you are. That if you have the weapon, you, like, everyone is just going to roll over. And it's like other things, somebody who has very limited ideas of what other people's priorities are. um, Just kind of paints their own motivations onto everyone else. There's a really nice paragraph where he, like, is sort of, like, someone laughs and then he draws a whole load of conclusions. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the last line is... uh, and then I thought that maybe that was too much to try and draw from just a laugh. <laughs> yes, yeah. He also, in describing things in that, like, observational stream of consciousness kind of way, anthropomorphizes or, like, ascribes a sort of fantastical agency to a lot of inanimate things. There's, like, the stained glass window you were talking about before. Um, but that's not the only time that he does it. It's just sort of throughout. And so it really gives you this sense of his his internal monologue being, in some ways, almost, I don't know, like, prone to flights of fancy or, like, childlike in some ways. Like, he hasn't lost this sense of imagination about the world where he just sort of lets his thoughts run away with him somewhat freely in a very endearing way. Mm. Do you have an example? Well, like the stained glass window, but there are some other ones. Like it, that wasn't the only time, but it's just like he's telling this whole story, like this fairy tale about the of the stained glass window, which is a stationary thing. Yeah. And so, like, he's just sort of daydreaming, but he does this all the time when he observes everything. He's like imagining all of these things, the lives that they would have had, like the um, when he's in the the casino and he's thinking about what the building used to be used for and. Mm the things that have been preserved and the things that haven't and like the things that the room has seen and things. And he's just sort of letting his mind wander down those like trains of thought in a way that's kind of adorable. Philip Marlowe, adorable. Well, you know, prone to daydreamy flights of fancy. So I've got one last thing to talk about here with the, Storytelling and how it's written and stuff. Okay. Do you have anything else you want to add before I get into it? Nope. 
So you mentioned that there's kind of a false wrap up in the middle of the book. Yep. Where it sort of kind of ends and then it continues. Mm -hmm. There's a really good reason for that. Was he? Was it originally a short story in in the villa or something? It was originally two short stories. Ah, oh. because well, you literally cut the book in half, and like there are two complete stories. Like they could be sequential short stories. Yep. Where it's like, and I wrapped up the story, but I'm kind of curious about this thing that came up before. So I'm going to follow that, follow on that instead. Yep. Like. So um, it's actually created by two, uh, from two stories called "The Killer in the Rain" and "The Curtain." And you remember, like, when they're talking about Reagan having disappeared, mm -hmm. they talk about him having pulled up the curtain. Right, that he was intentionally, he intentionally disappeared. No one disappeared him. Yeah. Yeah. So they've both been previously published in Pulps, mm -hmm. and he cannibalized them together. Okay. And you can really see the seam, like, it's around yeah. page 160-ish. Yeah, it's almost in the middle of the book. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's uh, not page 160, page 126 to 130. Yeah, because it's... 250 pages and yeah. it's pretty much exactly in the middle yeah it's you have that da office scene mm -hmm. and he wraps everything up there and goes home and then the next next scene you get is him sitting down with the head of missing persons in what feels like like if you read just the first few paragraphs of that chapter you could be reading the start of a new book very much yeah yeah um apparently they had like the two stories had some common elements like there was a older father who's worried about his wild daughter mm -hmm. um and there's like the the father is father figures are both combined into general stonewood and then the two daughters are carlin mm -hmm. and then he sort of just adds in other things around there and runs from similar things throughout mm -hmm. so that was originally going to be one of my fun facts but i thought that it, it uh, was something you picked up on i should we should talk about it a little bit yeah it it is a little weird like i don't i don't know that it's as neatly done as it could be like it very much yeah. f you feel the break and you're like this feels very wrapped up though yeah. like what are we gonna have to read about for the second half of the book and you're like oh, okay but this is kind of a different mystery though but wait there's more yeah it feels uh, like a new episode you know and it sort of explains to a degree why people keep being like oh but you're looking for this guy right it's it's setting mm -hmm. up the second half of the book and things yeah. Um, and it's interesting because you can also sort of see a bit of a split with the themes mm. and like what the concerns are throughout different parts of it. Some of the things that are important things in the first half of the book sort of drop away and disappear mm. and you get new thoughts brought up in the second half, I think. Yeah. So. I thought it was neat. Yeah. It was interesting. As you say, it's not done as cleanly as it could be. Mm hmm I think we've kind of talked about everything I wanted to talk about in terms of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the main thing. So I think we're on to the big question now. Yeah. So I think the big question for this book is, what is this book, or even just this genre that's sort of being started with this book and its contemporaries, trying to say or stimulate in its audience? Because I think a lot of genres do sort of have a mission to explore certain kinds of ideas or promote certain kinds of ideas. What do, what do we feel like this book and or this genre is trying to say or do? Okay. So, I mean, this, this sort of genre is a subcategory of mystery. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, one of the issues that I always had in academia was that you get this argument against genre fiction in general, but mystery is part of that, is that I think I've complained about science fiction being part of that before. But the mystery side of it is that you'll hear people say, in response to a suggestion that it's culturally important, it makes a statement, and they'll say, well, no, because it's about the return to the status quo. And there's this idea that, like, there's a murder at the start of the book, and then at the end of the book, the person who did the murder has been caught, and it's all wrapped up neatly, and you're back to where you started from. And that it's not about challenging anything, it's about reinforcing those ideas, which... I always felt was a very short-sighted way of viewing it. I'm sure that there are some stories where that is the case. Well, in this one, the murderer isn't apprehended. Right. So I feel that... So one of the arguments that I've always made is that how the murderer is apprehended, what the crime is, and how it's viewed by everyone around it within the book is going to tell you much more about where we are and whether the murderer is apprehended or not is going to tell you more about that and where the author is suggesting that we should go. I think that there's a lot to be said and a lot to be challenged with the mystery genre. I think there's a lot that the mystery genre can do to speak out and to challenge 
the status quo as much as to reinforce it. Um, it all depends on how it's being used. And I feel that here it is, this particular part of the mystery genre is inclined to do that more because you have got this, it's set up as this person against the world. Mm-hmm. The detective doesn't have a entire department behind them in mm-hmm. the way that a uh, like police procedural mm-hmm. fiction does. Not that I'm saying that that can't change things. I'm just talking specifically about this. It enables the author to take a certain set of values that may or may not be held by the predominant culture and talk about those as being the main thing. Marlowe doesn't have to be backed up by anyone for Chandler to be able to say, Marlowe believes this and that's the good thing. Marlowe believes that corruption is this, that the death penalty is this. Mm-hmm. It it can be put up against what society thinks within that framework, mm-hmm. but Marlowe's able to have the last word on it. I realise that I'm just having a little bit of a soliloquy over here. Does that make sense? It does. I think it is related, but not quite the same as what I would say my answer is. I think that this book overall, and to a certain extent, like the hard-boiled detective genre, is trying to promote this idea of questioning assumptions and looking beyond the letter of the law or ethical codes in making judgments, which I think are related but not quite the same. Like, I think that the fact that he keeps looking and he doesn't take anything at face value and is not content with what does the law say is the right thing to do, which is a certain kind of assumption, assuming that the law is just, assuming that the police are making the right call and are acting in good faith. He's throwing all of that out, not trusting any of that, but going only on the information he can gather himself and the things that he can do and what feels right or wrong and justified to him in terms of a risk or in terms of something that's true, if that makes sense. And so I think that it's trying to push this idea of being brave enough to not just look, to not just use the law or the rules, whatever the rules are, as like the be all end all of making a decision, but looking further and actually investigating things on your own and seeing if that's actually the right thing to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's. I think it's an interesting sort of take on sort of individualism. Mm. Like, I think that you can take an unhealthy message from these stories of, you know, you're the only one that matters and it's you against the world and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, and it doesn't matter whether something is illegal or unethical if you think it's right or if it's the best thing for you. Which I think is the wrong message to take because, mm. like, Marlowe doesn't think... That doesn't do what is best for him. Mm-mm. He categorically does not. And No, he doesn't. Throughout these stories, it's not about what's best for you. It's about what's best for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, it's never the person against the world. It might be ca- sort of shown that way a little bit, but there's always the people that help you out sort of thing. Like, if you take Bernie Olds out of this book, mm-hmm. nothing happens. Yeah. Marlowe doesn't get referred in the first place. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have any extra information. He doesn't find out about Owen's death. When he goes to Captain Gregory, there's no one to vouch for him to say that the information be given. He's not one man against the world. He has friends who support him. Mm -hmm. Maybe not a lot of friends. When you read other books, though, I mean, like, and Westerns as well, like, there are the people that help out the lone gunslinger. There's the person that patches him up after he's been shot. Mm -hmm. And, like, that's a recurring thing. So, like, it's... You have a team of friends that you that support you and believe in the same things as you do. Mm-hmm. And you are doing it for a greater good. It's just you're choosing what that greater good is rather than it being defined by a larger power. Yeah. It's about, if it's individualist, it's about thinking for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, which I guess is to some degree why there's that kind of like sideways look at the people who are acting the way Hollywood has told them to. Yeah, not just the people who are acting the way Hollywood told them to and just sort of adopting this thing without even really examining it or doing their own thing, but also a very contemptuous portrayal of people who are constantly trying to escape from their own thoughts and trying to escape from the decisions they've made, like Vivian, who is constantly getting drunk and gambling to 
you know, run away from her guilt over hiding her sister's murder of her husband. And Marlo has a lot of contempt for that because he's like, he he is promoting this idea of like, no, you think for yourself, you stand by your decisions or you do what you can to make good on the mistakes you've made. You don't just run away from it and pretend it didn't happen and try to not look at it too hard. So I, I definitely think that that's true. Yeah. That right. it, yeah, it's thinking for yourself, which I think is part of that is questioning assumptions, not using, as you say, an externally imposed code, whether that's the law or the ethics of your job or whatever, to make you feel better about things that you really in your heart feel are wrong. Yeah, and I mean to your point of like standing by decisions, like after Marlo kills Canino, he could pile Mona Mars into a car, ditch his gun somewhere, and drive away. There'd be no one to say that he was there. But he calls the police and tells them about and it. He's like, hey, yeah. hey, Bernie, kill the guy. <laughs> Come help me out with this. Yeah. And he knows that could go badly for him. Yeah. But he also knows, like, he thinks it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Did we answer our question? I think so. That this genre and this book in particular is really advocating for thinking for yourself and questioning assumptions, even when that's hard. And, yeah, and, it, and I think it does also, like, just give a vehicle for authors to provide... Social commentary. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that answers the big question. But I think the bigger question for you today is, who killed Owen Taylor? Speak your thought process. Wasn't it a suicide? It was ruled a suicide. It's discounted as a suicide. Uh. Like, it's theorised as a suicide, and then they're like, no, that doesn't add up. I feel like if it was Vivian, that would have been called out. Well, I say it was discounted as a suicide. It's suggested as a possible suicide, but it's not ever conclusive. Mm -hmm. The newspapers report it as one, but the newspapers report a whole lot of things. And if it was a suicide, what's the motive? Because he killed somebody? Just, like, guilt? He killed somebody after he had, like... And then, like, had the wherewithal to take out the photo negatives and then drove away... And someone got them from him, so someone else had to have taken them from him. Right. Presumably as part of the murder. But I feel if uh, if he was desperate enough to have gone and killed someone to try and protect Carmen, then he would have also been... He would have then gone after Joe or something to try and get the photos back and continue the project. Yeah, I don't know. Any other theories? I mean, I can think of people who didn't, because obviously it wasn't... Geiger, because Geiger was the one that he kills. Yes. It wasn't Joe, or at least Joe said it wasn't him, but I guess it could have been, because he did get the... Joe saps him. Yeah. And that wound is said to have bled... A lot. Under, ...under the skin before he died. Mm-hmm. So he was alive for a little while after that. Mm-hmm. Go it's on. possible that he essentially kind of kills himself or gets into a car, car accident somehow by accident with, like, the brain damage or the head wound from yeah. the sap. So then it would be Joe, but not directly? There's an argument made by the diver that, like, it could be suicide because he, like, hits, could have hit his head on the way down, could have hit the, um, hand throttle down, and, like, it was a fairly straight line to the barrier. So that's possible. It is possible. Do you want to know who Raymond Chandler said killer? Sure. Raymond Chandler says he doesn't know. Interesting. When they made a movie, the director was like, who killed this guy? Like, this guy is dead in my film, and I don't know why. And went to Raymond Chandler and was like, who? And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> Raymond Chandler is said to have been much more interested in atmosphere and character than he was in plot, and apparently just wasn't massively concerned about the fact that someone's dead for no particular reason in his story. Not for no particular reason. For story reasons. Yes. For story reasons, not necessarily uh, with a clear line of who did what. Yeah. Huh. That's funny. There we go. Okay, that is big question, bigger question, which leaves us with fun facts and interesting tangents. Any fun facts? Interesting tangents? Might be more of an interesting tangent. I, in the interest of fun facts, was looking up whether there were any interesting, like, rare editions of this book, because that's kind of the thing at the beginning, is Raymond Chandler is investigating the rare book dealer. I think it's Philip Marlowe. Uh, you know what I mean? Ray, uh, yeah, Philip Marlowe is investigating the rare book dealer who's not really a rare book dealer, he's a smut dealer, and probes 
whether they're a legit shop by asking about rare editions of Ben-Hur that don't exist, and does the same at another rare bookshop that's actually a rare bookshop. So apparently, while nothing immediately came up for whether there are actually rare editions of this book, apparently it is a problem for women who are interested in literature and rare books to, like, have shithead guys probe their, like, legitimacy as knowledgeable about rare books by asking this exact, like, set of bullshit rare book questions that Marlo asks the Jewish proprietor of the rare book shop and Agnes proprietor of Geiger's shop the about Ben-Hur editions with specific errors. And, like, this, a woman wrote a post about it and was like, and it's always guys. I've never had a woman do this. And it's very much in that sort of gatekeeping, you know, do you really know your shit kind of way. I was just like... Okay, so apparently that's a thing that women in the business of rare books have to deal with from shitty mystery fans. And the correct response is to slap them with a copy of the Big Sleep. <laughs> yes. So I've got a couple of fun facts and one shitty comment. Uh, I feel that's just who I am as a person. It sums me up. So Roman Chandler wrote this character that has become like one of the main, like, American icons. Mm-hmm. Um, so, as you can imagine, Chandler was born in Chicago. Mm-hmm. At the age of two, he moved to uh, the UK mm-hmm. and lived there until he he was about 24. Mm-hmm. So, he actually spent most of his formative years um, in the UK and I believe went to Oxford. Might be making that up. Might have made that up. But before he eventually returned to San Francisco. So, I thought it was interesting. Which is presumably why his writing is so smart and such now. <laughs> There are definitely some Britishisms in his writing that I noticed. This is a British edition of the book that we've been reading, ah. um, and they have definitely changed the spellings to British things. Okay. And I'm not sure whether it was... I would have to, I'd be interested to pick up an American version because there's the phrase, played it close, close to the waistcoat, mm-hmm. which I don't think is a phrase. Close to the vest is a phrase. Yeah. Um, I'm close to the chest is a phrase. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wonder whether someone's like, close to the vest? Oh, they mean a waistcoat. <laughs> Chandler once advised for people writing stories, uh, when in doubt, have a man come through the door with a gun in his hand, which I think is advice that he follows about 47 times in this book. Uh, twice in one scene at one point when Brody's like someone knocks on the door and it's Carmen with a gun in her hand and then about three pages later someone knocks on the door and it's Carol Longrum with a gun in his hand. <laughs> really struggled with that scene apparently. I don't know if we want to include this, but Chandler also wrote the Ten Commandments for writing a detective novel. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll read these out, but we can cut this if we don't want to include it. One, it must be credibly motivated, both as to the original situation and the denouement. Two, it must be technically sound as to the methods of murder and detection. You can't have anyone die and not know who did it. <laughs> Three, it must be realistic in character, setting, and atmosphere. It must be about real people in a real world. Four, it must have a sound story value apart from the mystery element, i.e. the investigation itself must be an adventure worth reading. Five, it must have enough essential simplicity to be explained easily when the time comes. I feel like that would have worked if it stayed two separate stories, but mashing them together kind of threw that out the window. Six, it must baffle a reasonably intelligent reader. Seven, the solution must seem inevitable once revealed. Eight, it must not try to do everything at once. If it is a puzzle story operating in a rather cool, reasonable atmosphere, it cannot also be a violent adventure or a passionate romance. Nine, it must punish the criminal in one way or another, not necessarily by operation of the law. If the detective fails to resolve the consequences of the crime, the story is an unresolved chord and leaves irritation behind it. Ten, it must be honest with the reader. I'm not sure he hits all of those notes. No, because Carmen definitely doesn't have any sort of consequences definitively. Like, it's um, you hope that Vivian goes and gets her in some sort of situation where she's under supervision and getting medical help, but it's not clear that that happens. Yeah. There's nothing Marlo can really do to make her. Um, I'm also not sure that... I would say it's in a, it, it seems inevitable that it was Carmen that killed Rusty. 
Yeah. I'm not sure how reasonable it is to have seen that coming. No. Like, I think maybe the pieces are there, but I would, I would argue the point. Like, yeah. did you, did you predict it? No. No. And you tend to be pretty good at that. So. Yeah. The last thing I have is that there is a character in the book who complains about lifting boxes of books that are a hundred pounds a box. Mm -hmm. As someone who works with boxes of books on a daily basis, that would be really hard to do. Mm. Like a reasonably large, reasonably densely packed box of books is like fifty pounds. They must be really big boxes. I don't. I don't know. Or very dense books. I don't know what's going on with this. Be exaggerating. Yeah, he could be, but he's wrong. <laughs> Okay, I have a follow-up point. We had talked during our episode on Ziggy Stardust by David Bowie mm -hmm. about the fact that they were planning to release more of his previously unreleased work. We're actually recording this episode late today, uh, which you'll tell, by the way, that it's probably not come out until the day after it's supposed to come out. But it means that we're recording on January 8th, which is actually the day that Bowie would have turned 73. Mm -hmm. It's the, I think, four-year and two-day anniversary of his death. And they've just announced they're going to do that. Um, they are releasing a six-song EP that will release a track a week for the next six weeks. And it's looking like it's going to be a limited release. They're going to do some vinyl for Record Store Day and some CDs, so we'll try and get our hands on it. But they have actually released today a previously unreleased new version of The Man Who Sold the World. Um, so if you go and Google that, we'll also try and put a link to it in the show notes. But I suspect that we're going to wrap up this recording and go and listen to it. Um, so go and take a look. And yay! And I hadn't told Charlotte about this before, so that this is news to her. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm actually surprised you didn't see it anymore. Me too. Okay, um, did you have any other feedback, follow-up, late thoughts? Don't think so. Okay, we will leave it there then. You can find us on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, at Unramblings, on Twitter, at UnramblingsPod, and you can email us uh, with any any thoughts or news you'd like us to hear, or suggestions for future episodes, all that jazz, at unramblingspodcast at gmail.com. Also, if you're an agent that would like to represent me, you can do that too. And please feel free to continue the discussion on social media with the hashtag Unramblings, and we will try and chime in where we can. Also, tell all your friends, and please review us on whatever podcast media you use, if you can, or go and find a way of reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, because it's where everyone actually reads reviews. Yay! Uh, anything you want to add? Nope. Cool. Thank you for listening to Unramblings. We hope you'll join us next week. Hi, Misty. Yes. Hello. You want to come down here? Come on. Ooh.